Hi everyone, my name is Brooke and I'm a geologist. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to look at rocks with your hand lens and how to record that information and lay it out nicely in your field notebook. Collecting notes is really important. It'll help you understand where your collection comes from and the conditions it formed in and what's happened to those rocks afterwards. Uh, it'll help you understand the environments that those rocks represent. If you're a student and, and or you wanna become a professional geologist, then learning how to keep a good notebook, field notebook is essential for recording all of your information, especially if you're gonna use it for scientific research later. Or if you're working in industry, then your book is a legal document and is, it's, it's part of your job to keep it up to date. To start, we're gonna look at these rocks exposed on the seafront at Redcar, which is on the coast of Cleveland and the northeast of the UK, not Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> In the last episode, we measured the strike and dip of these rocks, so we know that they have a shallow dip to the north and they strike east-west. Now we need to describe their characteristics in more detail and come up with a lithology which tells us what kind of rocks we're actually dealing with. And we're going to start doing that by working at the outcrop scale. Pause here and take five minutes to write down or think about the different things that you notice about this outcrop. You can try making a sketch of it too if you'd like. Don't try and be too technical or scientific, just think in terms of basic colours, shapes and textures. To help you out, the pink outline shows the area of the exposed rock, so just concentrate on that. Here's my sketch in my notebook. Sketches don't have to be artistic, it's better if they're more like a cartoon. They just need to be good enough for another geologist to identify what you've seen if they go at the same place. Your sketch should have a scale and an orientation, so I've shown that the outcrop is about 5 metres across and that it strikes to the east. You should also annotate the important features and give it a date and a title. The most important features I've identified here are that there are at least two types of rock in the outcrop. Rock type 1 is yellow, brown or red and it's resistant to erosion. Rock type 2 is black, grey or blue-grey and is less resistant to erosion and that's why we've got this kind of set of, looks like a set of steps. I've also done a little sketch trying to show that what I think this outcrop would look like in a cross section. I've exaggerated the dip on this sketch to make it easier to see. So you can see how I think that the tilt has caused the soft beds to get eroded quicker than the hard beds and that's why the hard beds stick up when we get this step like shape. It's a really good idea to, to write down your working out and your ideas like this in your field notebook to help you out later on. And if you're a student or you are working in industry, this is the kind of stuff that will show your examiners or, or whoever you're working for that you're, you're trying to work through problems, you're trying to think how things go together. Now let's get up closer and see what else we can observe. Here is a close-up of the outcrop we just sketched. Pause and take another five minutes to make an annotated sketch in the same way you did for the last photo. Again, the pink line is the area to focus on. In this sketch, it might be easier if you ignore perspective and try to draw the outcrop as a flat 2D diagram, which is what I've done. So here's my sketch and notes. I'll take you through the observations and then we will interpret them later. So remember to observe, record and then interpret last. If you start interpreting things early on, you can get stuff wrong and then tie yourself up in knots and end up really confused. I'm speaking from experience when I say that as well. So I think that there are two rock types here. Rock one is soft, easily eroded and has a few thin shelled, mostly complete bivalve fossils. Bivalve is the scientific term for things like clams, oysters, cockles and scallops. They're mollusks and they have a shell that closes with two valves, two shells basically. These fossils are in the life position, which means that, that most of them died and were buried where they were living, sat on the seabed. So that's an bit important to note down. Rock 1 also has a very faint low angled cross lamination too and where it is on top of rock 2 it generally gently drapes across rock 2 like a blanket. Let's look at rock type 2 now. Rock 2 is hard and resistant and has lots of thick shelled bivalve fossils that are in different positions and often broken. Some of them are in life position but most are all higgledy piggledy and just jumbled about. Rock 2 also has prominent cross lamination and internal erosion structures. Rock 2 also erodes down through Rock 1 and sometimes down into the next layer of Rock 2. And that's another important observation there, is that they're stacked on each other in alternating layers. 
So now we've got those observations, we need to get up as close as we can and examine the rocks with our hand lens to try and identify what kinds of rocks we have here. Though I'm sure a lot of you have already started to come up with some ideas, we can test those ideas by making further detailed observations. Sometimes you can be really lucky and there's a chunk of rock that you can pick up, up, you can see where it's come from, but this time I had to get right down onto the rock to look at the details. I'm applying the same techniques I used on the outcrop scale to look at this scale. So I'm looking at the colours, shapes and textures, but this time I'm focused on the individual grains that make up the rock and then the small scale structures. Starting with rock type 1, I could see that it was fine grained and even though I could see some quartz sand grains and the fossils, that there was also a lot I couldn't see because the grains were too small to see with my hand lens and that's what made up the bulk of the rock. So to get round this, I gently chewed a bit of the rock. Your teeth and tongue are more sensitive than your eyes or fingers to texture and I could feel lots of grains of silt and very fine sand sized grains but there was also something else that was very fine and had the consistency of toothpaste. And that toothpaste texture is a good indicator of clay sized grains and that's usually phyllosilicate minerals like smectites or mica. We now have enough information to identify rock one. The combination of fossils, sedimentary structures and grains means it must be a sedimentary rock. The sedimentary grains are dominated by clay sized particles so it's leaning towards a claystone. But claystones are nearly pure clay and here there's still a lot of sand and silt grains present so I'm going to call it a mudstone. There are classification schemes if you want to be really super accurate but this is going to do just for our introductory video. I'll make a note of this in my book and then repeat the process for rock type 2 but I won't show it just to save time. And grains in rock 2 so I didn't need to chew it and I could also see a fine grained material that smelled kind of like cement and fizzed with dilute acid which was the vinegar from my chips in this case. So I knew that it must be a carbonate mud and I could also see some little calcite crystals filling in gaps between the grains. This means that rock 2 is a sandy limestone because the carbonate mud and calcite grains are much more abundant than the quartz sand grains. Here's a nice close-up of those thick-shelled bivalves. If you're not familiar with European fossils, these are a type of bivalve called Gryphea, or Gryphea arctuata in this case. More commonly known in the UK as devil's toenails because they look a bit like hooves. They were thought to have been left by demons dancing on hot rocks when the world was young. They're actually a type of early oyster and are really common in early marine Jurassic rocks in the UK and Western Europe. So now let's have a look at how I put this in my notebook. So what I've done is I've put my position there, Redka Rocks, 500 metres east of the big tower. And that's the best you can do if you don't have a GPS or a grid reference. Put the date, I've put the weather and the conditions, so because that might affect what the rocks look like. And I've put observation there because it's what I'm directly observing. So I've just written obs. If someone else was telling me something, I would put whatever that person, I would say Sarah said or whatever or something that I'd read out of a book or paper and I've just give a quick description of my first impression of the rock blue grey mudstone with shallow angle cross beds and shelly bits interbedded in cycles with thin limestones full of these big oyster fossils I've put my strike and dip in and I've done a little quick cartoon diagram of what I've seen and put some notes in. Try to draw one of the ammonites there because that could be useful for getting the date of these rocks if we don't know it. And then I've put, listed the different types of fossils I've seen. I don't know what species they are apart from say the Gryphea, the big oysters, the devil's toenails, but I've listed the kinds of stuff I've got. So various bivalves, Gryphea, rare brachiopods, ammonites, some of them really big, bits of wood, crinoids and worm tubes, and then fish bits. And so that's a good start to describing this rock unit. What I would then do if this was my mapping area and I was studying it properly is I would then walk around and try and get a, a sense for it and add in more and more details until I'd built up as a complex picture. Did little sketches as, as well as taking photographs of interesting things. And I would fill this out and I would then decide what my rock was and give it a name and try and think about what kind of environment it represented especially if I was doing mapping or some kind of large-scale research. Now let's put all this information together and interpret the observations that we've recorded. 
Firstly, our mudstone. The combination of features that we've observed in this rock are consistent with a marine depositional environment that was far enough from land to be dominated by fine grains, but close enough to still have sand and silt deposited too. The intact thin-shelled bivalves in life position mean that the water in this location was probably below all but the biggest storm waves for most of the time, because otherwise the bivalves would have thicker shells and they'd be broken up. However, the cross lamination shows that there were seabed currents acting most of the time to move sediment around. And cross lamination and cross bedding are what happens when you get a, a, a sideways cross section through a sand dune or a ripple. This kind of environment is really common offshore from modern delta dominated coastlines, for example. So we could infer that maybe we were in an offshore environment near a big river delta where lots of sediment was getting dumped into the sea. Now let's talk about our sandy limestone. To get carbonate mud, you need warm, relatively shallow water. The types of fossils tell us we were still in a marine setting. The common, larger sand grains mean we're probably now slightly closer to the coastline or the sediment source. The observation of large-scale cross-lamination thick shelled bivalves that are often broken up and erosion within and between beds tells us that the seabed was getting regularly dug up and redeposited by waves, a process we call reworking. This means that the seabed was relatively shallow and that waves could reach the seafloor on a daily basis. Places where several beds have been eroded probably represent big storms. Another bit of evidence that we are closer to land and the sediment source is that the sandy limestone beds have a lot more fossil wood in them. I found a whole three metre long tree branch in one bed, so that was pretty cool. The fossils present also allow us to date this rock to the Cinemurian stage of the early Jurassic, so around 197 million years ago. That's a lot younger than the rocks I usually work with. There's still a lot more information we can pull out of these outcrops, both about the ancient Jurassic marine environment and the geological processes that formed the outcrop later on, but I think this will do for now. So there we go, that's how and why we keep a good field notebook and that's how you take your field descriptions when you find a rock for the first time. I hope this helps you out regardless of, of whatever reason you're doing geology. In terms of geology techniques or geological information, types of fossils and minerals, that kind of thing, or any other comments, stick them down below and I'll see if I can help you out. Until next time, take care and I'll see you later, rock nerds. Bye-bye.